Welcome everyone to Tama Talks, brought to you by the Torrance Art Museum Advocates. I'm Janine Madden, current Tama president, and I'd like to thank you for watching. Today's talk will feature work currently on view at the museum from the exhibition, Uncivil War, an election special in the main gallery. If you're planning on a trip to Torrance, take some time to stop in and see the show before it closes on December 10th. <clears throat> TAM hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Admission to the museum is free and donations are accepted and appreciated. You can find the museum on the web at www.torrenceartmuseum.com. This discussion will be recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel with all of our previous TAMA talks. You can access it from our website at www.tamadvocates.com. Uh, the TAM website summarizes Uncivil War and Election Special as an exhibition which explores the events of January 6, 2021 in Washington, D.C., which shocked the nation. The country has felt a divided space with a polarization and demonizing of opposition that has left many citizens in fear that a spark could ignite the fires of civil war. There has been a steady build in journalist articles reflecting upon the possibility of a second U.S. civil war. Regardless of the realities of this, the fact remains that this concern is a part of the current zeitgeist. What will the current midterm elections bring us? Increased enmity or a rejection of extremism? Will democracy win out or will armed insurrection begin? Or will the status quo continue to stoke the embers of discontent? This exhibition is curated by Max Presneel, the director and head curator at the museum. Uncivil War features artists Lisa Ann Auerbach, Diana Sofia Estrada, Sandow Burke, Essie Mero, Jeremy J. Quinn, Dred Scott, Allison Stewart, Gabby Strong, Keith Walsh, Ruth Yanamoto, and Michelle Jacquis, who joins us today. Michelle is an interdisciplinary artist, educator, and academic administrator based in Los Angeles. Her work has been exhibited in alternative spaces, galleries, and museums, and film, video film and video festivals across the US and in Australia, Canada, Ireland, England, New Zealand, and South Korea. Paraphrasing her artist statement, Michelle is trained in the expanded field of sculpture in uh, to include installation, video, and performance art, where she combines strategies of conceptual art, documentary, and social practice. Through long-term projects utilizing a range of media, her work examines the complexities within personal and social relationships, identity, language, and communication all of which are informed by her worldview, which is predicated on the belief that most conflicts arise out of fear generated by a lack of knowing, understanding, and communicating with the other, whomever that may be. Therefore, she often facilitates situations in which she is in conversation with, learning from, and collaborating with people who are different than she is, whether generally, culturally, linguistically, developmentally, or neurologically. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Janine. Absolutely. Glad you're here. So I'm going to go ahead and let you share your screen. You should be able to. Mm -hmm. Let me see. There you go. I see it. I can. Great. So um, I figured I'd start with a few slides of the work of mine that's included in the Uncivil War exhibition at Torrance Art Museum. Um, this is both an installation shot and a detailed view of the piece, What's Left to, to Hold Us Together. It's a deconstructed American flag that hangs from the ceiling. Um, and it really grew out of uh, conversations with Max and Keith Walsh, one of the other artists in the exhibition, as we were talking a lot about what this exhibition would be, what, what the theme was, what artists, which artists might be good for it. And um, so I, 
I kind of, they left, both of them left my studio and I immediately thought like, oh, it's about like the country being pulled apart, right? And um, I, I feel like on, on one side, there's those who want to hold on to white heteronormative patriarchy and those power structures. And then on the other side, there's those who want to embrace diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility on the other. And, um, you know, everything that's in the statement about the exhibition in terms of our, you know, what, what's happening to our democracy is, is at stake here. This is, um, installation view of two drawings of mine that are in the exhibition. They're graphite on paper. The one on the left is named a nation of with the ellipsis after it. And on the right, it's called um, never again. And then these are three from a series that's in progress of altered American flags with embroidered text. Um, each one is titled American and then in parentheses has an excerpt of the text that's embroidered into it. And here's just a detail so you can see, you know, you don't notice the text from far away until you get up close because it's white on white. Um, all of this work really relates to an early piece of mine from 2006, which I think is probably the first time I expressed an affinity with those who've experienced migration, immigration, and displacement. And I think a lot of, you know, one of the big issues our country is having right now is, is debates about um, immigration rights and border control and who should be a citizen and who shouldn't, who should have permission to travel here and not, who should have permission to work here and not. Um, and there's a lot of xenophobia and racism embedded in, in a lot of those discussions right now. Um, I am the third generation of my family to be born in the United States. My um, father's side is, is French Canadian and Catholic. My mother's side are from various parts of Eastern Europe and um, Ashkenazi Jewish. So uh, I carried this poster in the 2006 May Day March for Immigration Rights in downtown Los Angeles. Um, I added text to this photograph of my great grandmother, uh, Bubby Pauline Zuckerberg Khan, and it's her standing in front of her apartment in New York City. I've since learned that Pauline was actually from Austria and it was her husband, Ben, um, who was from Russia. They both came to the U.S. in the early 1900s with their parents. They met in New York City, and um, they're both from small towns that I've figured out are now actually in Ukraine because, you know, the Austrian Empire and the Russian Empire kept changing the borders. Um, and they also did not gain their U.S. citizenship until after Ben was discharged from the U.S. Army. He served in World War I on the U.S. side. It was my maternal great-grandmother, my other maternal great-grandmother, Bubby Ida Kasarski, who came on the fake passport. Um, she was from Lithuania. I have a cousin who said, ah, it wasn't really fake. It was from a deceased person. Um, I think that still means it's fake. Um, but here she is in some family photos in the middle um, from like maybe 1951 and then on the two sides. Uh, from the early 70s, uh, shortly before I was born. Um, as I said, my father's side are, are French Canadian Catholics, and my twin sister and I share that last name. We look more like that side of the family, too. So we actually used to joke that uh, we would have survived the Holocaust because we kind of passed as Aryan with blonde hair, straight blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, and on my mother's side, you know, most of them came from what is called the Pale of Settlement. This was the eastern part of Russian Empire where Jews were relegated during the pogroms. Um, what weighs really heavy on me is the fact that my existence as one of the Ashkenazi Jewish American great grandchildren of that generation that came over uh, is only made possible because they escaped Eastern Europe before the Nazis rose to power. And, you know, on the left of this slide is is a map of what was the Pella settlement. On the right is my great grandfather's naturalization papers. 
um, most of my artwork over the past several years has really been motivated by this fact and also questions of how I as a progressive Jewish atheist feminist can be in solidarity with other marginalized groups. And I'm also really um, motivated by, you know, how do I respond to what's happening in the world and what has happened since Trump's election in, in 2016. Um, I felt really pulled at that time between simultaneous impulses to, you know, hide my and my son's Jewish heritage every time there was another anti-Semitic act. Um, and also wanting to fulfill the white supremacist fear that wealthy Jews like George Soros, the philanthropist or the progressive philanthropist, that people like that were funding the migrant caravan at the southern border. And so I sort of found like um, proclaiming my Jewishness, even as, as, as an identity, even if I'm not very religious, um, was a political act in this situation. And, you know, I had impulses to go to the southern border and bring in every refugee that I could, you know, but I'm not wealthy. I don't have the means to do that. So I funnel it into my work. You know, I was really traumatized by uh, seeing and hearing people in Charlottesville yelling, Jews will not replace us, and for our president to call them good people. You know, and then to see uh, rioters on January 6th wearing shirts that said Camp Auschwitz. And, um, you know, Camp, Camp Auschwitz staff, I think is what the, the guy's shirt said. So, the, you know, those kinds of things were really traumatic. And all of that's what's informing what I've been making. Um, so in 2018, I began this series of multilingual text-based drawings and embroideries. The whole series is called We Are Here Together. The first embroidery um, translates its title, We Are Here, into Yiddish and Spanish. So, Aun Zen and Da and Estamos Aquí. Um, and this is a, you can see a detail of the embroidery. The, each embroidery started with a drawing. So, um, on the right side, this was a diptych, so on the right side, these abstract lines are mapping the trajectories from uh, to Southern California, from Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, and to Ellis Island from Austria, La Russia, Lithuania, and Latvia. Again, I'm interested in, you know, acknowledging these two different waves of immigrants from two different generations, different geographic areas, but all people with the goal of coming to the United States for a better life, whether they're escaping violence or religious persecution or um, economic disparities, they're coming for the same reason, to have a better life. And, um, you know, Jews were not that welcomed when they came in the first place. Irish was not that, were not that welcome when they came in the first place, right? But um, there's also, you know, the, there is xenophobia and racism inherent in the concerns people have about why we should let pe other people in. Mm. Um, the embroideries were made by repurposing yarn um, from a sweater I've been, that I was unraveling. And it's a sweater my great grandmother Pauline made. Um, and this destruction, this act of destruction, I feel like is, is necessary part of creating something new or make, you know, and it's similar to how do we dismantle or destroy the oppressive systems in capitalism or in our government or other governments in order to uh, make it better. This drawing uh, references both the American and the trans flag. Um, it, it's also referencing the, the slogan, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. It's, and also the, um, I have a seven-year-old son, so I've watched a lot of this uh, Dr. Dr. Seuss's Horton Hears a Who. There's a scene at the very end where these characters who are too small to be seen by human, uh, regular-sized humans, 
are yelling repeatedly in unison, we are here, we are here, we are here, and they're trying to get louder and louder to be noticed. And so, you know, this is kind of also referencing that in a tongue-in-cheek tongue way. Never again, this is the drawing, one of the drawings included in the Torrance Art Museum exhibition. This is uh, translated in Hebrew, Japanese, and Spanish. Um, again, it's connecting the atrocities of the recent migrant camps along the U.S. border uh, with Mexico, with the atrocities of the Jewish concentration camps in Europe and the Japanese internment camps in the U.S. during World War II. There was a lot of um, rallying and uh, among Jewish Americans and Japanese Americans during when these migrant camps opened, um, using the slogan, never again is now. Uh, and thinking a lot about how do we not repeat these kinds of atrocities. And then here's the embroidery version of this piece. This drawing um, says we are here together in both Arabic and Hebrew. It's an obvious reference to Palestine and Israel, but also U.S. involvement in that situation. Um, this one says we are not your pawns in both English and Hebrew. It, I made this after Trump moved the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Um, and then here's the embroidery of this. Uh, during the racial reckoning of 2020, you know, I had a lot of conversations with friends and colleagues about the complex relationship that Ashkenazi Jews have to whiteness. This is the group, you know, group of Jews from Europe and we, you know, we simultaneously benefit from white privilege and, and are threatened and targeted by white supremacists um, and neo-Nazis. And, and honestly, um, you know, I think a lot about how I do feel more comfortable and in fact maybe more safe in multiracial and multicultural spaces than I do in predominantly white spaces, you know, because of that relationship. This is the last drawing in the series, and it's also included in the exhibition at TAM. Um, natives and, Im and immigrants and forced migrants and settlers and colonizers. It's, the, it's kind of also referencing that graphic design trope you see a lot in where it'll list all the Kennedys or all the Beatles or a bunch of graphic designers or a bunch of architects in this similar uh, graphic style. And um, this piece is titled A Nation of dot, dot, dot. Um, and again, here's the two drawings in the exhibition. Um, I, I found that I really enjoyed the embroidery process and it was something I was actually, you know, I do a lot of video um, and audio work, you know, the podcast and other works that during the pandemic was really hard to focus on, um, particularly when I didn't have childcare. So the idea of like going into my studio with headphones and working for hours at a time in this really isolated way wasn't quite possible, but I could be really productive on the embroideries um, while hanging out with my son, while supervising him on Zoom kindergarten or watching television or participating in Zoom meetings for work. Um, and I, found that even when the series was over, I was like, oh, I still wanna do more embroidery. I like this process. Um, and actually, Diana Sofia Estrada, who's in the exhibition, she made the watercolors of flooded US monuments and government buildings. Mm -hmm. um, she's the one that recommended to me that I do this with flags. And it, and it took me a while to figure out like, okay, well, what would the text be? Um, and ultimately I decided it would come from this other project that I've been working on. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, also since 2018, I, I've been recording conversations about how family stories are passed down from generation to generation and what it means to be American in our current context of multiculturalism, immigration, military service, Black Lives Matter and indigeneity. And it's a socially engaged documentary project that takes the form of an oral history recording workshop series and an audio podcast. 
Um, one of the questions that I've been asking all the participants is, what does it mean to be American? And it's kind of a, it's a hard question even for myself to answer, but those are the answers. That's what I've decided are, uh, that's what I've chosen to be embroidered onto these flags. And, and what's on display at the Torrance Art Museum are the first three in the series. Um, this one says it's such a complicated mess. It's a quote from season three, episode two with Beverly Natus. Beverly's an artist and educator based in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and here's a detail of it. A lot of the um, podcast episodes in the first season, everything was recorded in person. And then I started doing some remote on, on I think at first I tried out Google Hangout and, and now Zoom works much better. And it's allowed me to have these conversations with people outside of Los Angeles too. And then it became really necessary, obviously during the pandemic. For this flag, I started using a seam ripper to take out the stars or to at least like uh, destroy them a little bit. This is the second flag I made. The quote says to be able to admit that there's a lot of work to do. This quotes Cole M. James from season three, episode one, and, and they're also an artist and educator, but based in Los Angeles. And here's a detail. Um, and in this one, the stars are even more deteriorated. I took them apart as much as I could. This third flag in the exhibition, the quote says, how do, how do I confront, confront the things I was raised to believe are true when I know in fact they are not? Mm -hmm. This is from Holly M. Crawford in season three, episode six. And here's a detail. And, and in this one, the stars start out intact at the top and then it's like a gradient where they're gradually more and more deconstructed. And um, I'll be facilitating an oral history recording workshop at the Torrance Art Museum on October 29th. We'll do this from one to three. It's, it's going to be an in-person workshop um, in the hours prior to the panel talk that's happening that day. And participants will be paired up and taught how to use digital audio recorders as well as the voice memo app on their phones. They'll record conversations about what it means to be American and what it would take to cause or prevent a US, another US civil war. Um, each participant will then be given a copy of their recording and the opportunity to share excerpts with the larger group. And then they'll also have the option to include their recording in a future episode of the We Are All Americans podcast. And then quotes from those will be pulled um, and embroidered onto the next series of flags. Mm -hmm. My hope is, is that the participants will have meaningful conversations with someone they don't know, um, maybe bridge a divide. Um, you know, I, I, I think similar to what you read about in my, from my artist statement, uh, I really feel like if we if we don't develop meaningful relationships with people that are different from us, we may never pull the country back together. I think um, there's you know when we when we don't those kinds of conversations can help us to minimize you know the mythical stereotypes. They can help us to mitigate unconscious bias. Um, and, and to just, you know, see people as, as deeper, more complex beings than, uh, just what, you know, ignorance what makes us so fearful right. of, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, that's absolutely amazing. Um, you, your work, um, I think really speaks to the theme. I'm glad that you had an opportunity to talk with Max beforehand because it really does speak to the theme. And, you know, as you spoke, many, many things came to mind. I jotted a few of them down. But um, when you're talking about civil war, I think that um, one of the things that 
and we lived in Montgomery for a while. So uh, being a Bostonian at the time Catholic uh, in in Montgomery, Alabama was quite, um, was very interesting to me. I really had kind of been sheltered from that sort of hatred before. Um, and this kind of reverse bigotry that we we kind of saw existing there. But, but the idea that um, when you think about the civil war in our country, uh, it was really states. And how, how would you even, I mean, when you think about a civil war happening now in the country, it's factions and people within entire states. Does that, you know, it's yeah, all 50 yeah. states are affected. Is it just that the people who, you know, how, how does it even occur? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it also makes me think about you know all the talk for decades, right? Where Texas says we're going to secede, right? California says we're going to secede, right? Um, and so, but then yes, there would be people within each of those states um, with differing opinions about what should happen, who may not want to secede. Exactly. I think it's um, Allison Stewart, uh, who has a portion of the, is it Gettysburg? Does she have a portion of her? Well, she goes to um, Civil War reenactments. Correct. Of, right. Okay. Not just, I think, in Gettysburg, maybe also some in California, which surprised me that that even exists um, and documents the Civil War reenactors. And, and yeah, I talked to her at the opening and she talked about, you know, the the people participating in these reenactments. Some of them are just like history buffs, and they've got the costume uniforms for both sides, and almost like a debate team, willing right. to play mm -hmm. either role, whether whether it aligns with their politics or not. But then there's the other people who are very dedicated and aligned politically with a particular side. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's where um, we that's I think I think hearing from her and hearing from you and um, the, and Keith is going to be doing the, the panel discussion as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to say that um, knowing this backstory, yours in particular, really draws the person into to the artwork you know, and, and having a deeper understanding of the inspiration behind it and why it was created really, I think, you know, it's, it's difficult with, particularly in Torrance, I'm just going to say it, um, particularly close to Orange County. Well, and yeah. And, and also I think that one of the things that, um, that Max has really been struggling with since becoming the curator is that, uh, you know, not everything that he puts in is is very well understood. It's a challenge for people to stand in front of a piece like yours and not see past what they may find, you know, the, the elephant in the room, the desecration of the flag, but not really realizing that it's a desecration of the lives of the people that this is supposed to be a symbol of. <laughs> so, yeah, I was really grateful also that Max before the show opened, he CC'd me on an email and I don't know if, if he had sent it, if he blind CC'd all the artists or if it was just me, but he sent it to the museum staff with a reminder of, it was sort of like, in case anyone asks, desecrating the flag is a form of protected free speech. Mm -hmm. and, and I really appreciated, good. you know, his, uh, willingness to include the work in a in a museum run by a government organization sure. um, and that he up front took that stand like we will protect this right if people he, come he is a he is a staunch staunch advocator uh you know protector of the of the work because like he said in his talk um you know a, it's not like he just goes and cherry picks people off the street that they really need to be presenting work to him that speaks to not only the theme, but is conveying, you know, you have to have a very clear understanding of what it is that you are trying to portray with the work that you're, that you're, um, that you're exhibiting and that it's a, it's a, 
it's like the ultimate form of self-expression. So you're hoping that people, and here's kind of just a question. Are you hoping that what is it that you're hoping to elicit in the viewer who doesn't know the backstory and just sees the work in front of them as they walk into the building? Yeah, well, I think with the ha the flag hanging from the ceiling, um, that one, the title, I feel like, um, you know, what's left to hold us together, I think gets at it pretty quickly. This, you know, I talked to with somebody at the opening um, who asked me, well, what is this piece about? And when I pointed out the title, they immediately said, oh, I get it. Okay. Yes. Good. It's about, you know, the country being pulled apart. Sure. And, and, and hanging on by this like tiny threads, keeping our democracy together. Yes. Um, with the I drawings, know. you know, I, I, I didn't finish Hebrew school, so I can't even read Hebrew. I, I don't, I worked with friends to deal with that translation and also with the Japanese translation, which I don't know. I know Spanish, but not great. Mm -hmm. um, so my hope is that if you know one of the four languages in that never again drawing, yes, um, you can at least recognize what the other languages are, even if you don't know how to read them. Sure. And make the connection like, oh, this yeah. is a translation. These are the, you know, and then make the cultural connections Connection. between um, these, the groups of people that use these languages, right? Yeah. Um, and then make the leap to the historical context in which why, why these groups of people have used those, that phrase never again. Um, with, the the flags with the embroidered text i'm not sure it matters so much that you know you know that the quotes come from the podcast and who specifically said them although that is in the wall text because i you know do want to credit the the people who said the quotes mm -hmm. um i'm i think i'm interested in getting people to think about the, you know, the American as an identity. First of all, like we're one of multiple, many countries that are part of the Americas, right? So it's also to me really strange to refer to citizens of the U.S. as American, Americans, right. um, even though that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but I th think, you know, this, I think there's there's been historically in our country the sense that we we're a melting pot, which really implies that we assimilate and we um, blend in and become one culture. But that one culture is pretty steeped in white heteronormative patriarchy. Sure. And I think we're so much more complicated than that. Yes. And, and that's what that podcast is about. And that's what the, the flags are about that. I think I just want people to recognize that, that, you know, one person's particular idea of what it means to be American is going to be very different than another person's. And the beauty is that this place is for all of that. Right. Um, the third flag, I think the, that might've been the podcast I listened to the third flag uh, the saying on that about everything that we believe to be true is not something to that effect. I think right, everything. Probably, I don't. Remember, yeah, I don't have it in front of me again. That's right okay. Now, but yeah, everything. I feel that like that's the most I've been powerful. Taught. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I just finished reading um, "Braiding Sweetgrass," which was an mm -hmm. excellent, excellent book. But there's a whole section in there about the Pledge of Allegiance and how, as a you know, seven-year-old, being I don't want to say forced, but uh, but you are <laughs> coerced, right? Yes, like coerced, sure. Kind of propagandized, and I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of eyebrow raising out there. But you know, it's it's just in, it's it's incomprehensible for a, a seven year old to understand what all those things mean, and um, 
I, I'm hoping that that some of these issues now are just being raised to a level of consciousness where there's a generation of people who can sort of step back and say, you know, okay, this may be how I was brought up, but it's really time to step back and say things really need to be different. And your comment earlier about, you know, traveling to the border and, you know, sponsoring families coming in. I mean, it's not like we're not giving that given that opportunity where I live. We have many um, Ukrainian families who have come to this part of the country and here I'm in Boston. And, you know, I'm sure it's happening all over. I mean, we had all the folks that just arrived in Martha's Vineyard. So it, it's not like it's from a long time ago. It's still happening now. And there are communities of people who are embracing um, those immigrants or deportees or whatever it is that you, you know, the, 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 the proper language to, to refer to them, but it's happening now. The, yeah. Yeah, and the, the Martha's, Martha's Vineyard situation, my drawing and embroidery that says we are not your pawns could have easily been about that. Absolutely. That Absolutely. group of people as well, right? Yeah. Where right. Um, the yeah. governor of Florida is the one who sent, you know, it, without warning or ex and even telling them where they were going. Sure. And I think that they actually, you know, I, I think your your work is exactly right. They were used as pawns in a, in a larger political game and gain game and, you know, basically lied to and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really had no recourse. And so, um, again, that's going to be a I, I would love to figure out a way to have um, Torn City Cable film that panel discussion, because I really think it's going to just be one where um, as an artist, you get the opportunity to explain what your art is trying to say, not what your mm -hmm. art is, but what it is that it's trying to say. I think a lot of people struggle, a lot of my friends at least struggle with this idea of, you know, modern contemporary abstract art, performance art. What does it, what does it mean? And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. there is a meaning behind it. And, and you need to chat with the artist to find out what it is that they are trying to to help you understand mm -hmm. so yeah I tend to think you know I teach at an art and design college and sometimes I think a lot of and I run interdisciplinary studies so I work with the students um, from all the fine arts and design majors and I tend to think about you know a lot of times designers talk about their their using design to solve a problem maybe or um and coming up with design solutions to things whereas i think artists we we're maybe problematizing the problems we're bringing up more questions we're not always answering the questions right um and that to me is also what's really interesting is is not know like i don't want to, the work to be didactic and even though i have a very progressive liberal political point of view um i'm trying not to make work that's um too didactic and, and agenda driven um i want the audience to think and then right. come up with their own right opinions about what's happening in the world right it's engaging on many levels i mean it's engaging to a point where i'm thoroughly immersed in what i'm looking at but also my brain is processing what i'm seeing into hopefully action so and i i what i like about the flags too is how from far away they just look like flags right and 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 um a a, you know, viewer in the museum who may not be that curious might just walk past them and think, oh, there's flags hung in the gallery. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Someone who walks up closer and sees, oh, those stars are coming apart. There's something else added. What, what does it say? What are these words? Gets a richer experience, I think, from the work. And then, you know, I would say also, <laughs> you know, I'm an academic too. So, you know, critical theory and critical thinking is very much um, a part of my practice of being an educator, being an artist, and 
so I think a lot of this work also is a pushback against uh, the other pushback against um, critical race theory and wokeness or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that my, my approach is like, no, we need this. We need to understand the difficult parts of our history as a country and as a society um, instead of whitewashing over it. Quite literally, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank you um, so very much for um, taking the time to put together the slides, but also to talk about them and share your personal history. Um, you know, there was uh, when you were going through the, some of what your family had gone through, particularly, for, and I'm not quite sure why, but the unraveling of the sweater was very mm -hmm. emotional for me. Um, and I'm sure for you to be able to touch that same yarn that she held to make that, I, I think we don't get that opportunity. How many of us can say that we have a garment that our ancestors once wore or have? Mm -hmm. Very few. And I think. made. Yeah. And made exactly. Yeah, like if you remember in the image of, of um, her standing in front of her apartment, she's wearing another outfit that's knit. Yeah. Um, and and I did another piece uh, years ago where I unraveled a different sweater, um, not quite knowing what I would make of the yarn, and in the end, the piece was just the photograph of the sweater intact. And then two balls of yarn on a shelf. Yeah. Um, and it was more about uh, family relationships deteriorating. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it is powerful. It's powerful. It's, yeah, it's kind of. I also a lot of this work. I didn't include slides of this, but another body of work I'm working on at the same time is referencing these letters that my great grandfather Ben wrote to Pauline to, while he was serving in the US Army in World War One. And um, and this was before yes. he was a citizen. Is that what you were saying? He did not get Yeah, and that's until that's after. also how the podcast began because I was really struck by the fact that he was willing and a lot of people do this, right? They're willing to serve in the military for a country that has not yet accepted them as a citizen correct and right. and what would make someone do that and i don't know for him if it was truly believing in the cause of what was happening in world war one or if it, it or if it was i'll join because it's a path to citizenship um i don't know his reasons but originally that was my goal with the podcast was i wanted to find other people who had gotten their citizenship because of US military service. And I kind of struggled to find, uh, connect with veterans, but then, um, and did a workshop at the site at side street projects in Pasadena. And the only people who showed up to the workshop was a mother and daughter who were just like regulars at that organization. So they showed up and said, Oh, what's happening today? Mm -hmm. And we told them, I said, I'm, we're recording oral histories and I'm really interested in immigrant and veteran stories. But, you know, I also, I recognize this was an African-American family. And I said to her, but I also recognize that not everybody came here willingly. And so she nodded like, okay. And mm -hmm. I said, so she said, yeah, let's do this. And I taught the daughter how to use the recorder. And then the mom and I, had the conversation and we talked a lot about, um, she was an educator and she talked about her daughter having to do like a, a family tree timeline project and, and how she and her husband struggled to, at that age of her daughter, like reconcile how much do they tell her about being descendants of the enslaved mm -hmm. and and then I talked to her also about like, you know, me growing up being raised by the Jewish side of my family and always like, we just kind of always knew about the Holocaust and which families survived and who didn't and who came before and who escaped. And, and, and then as parents, we both talked about how, how do we tell our kids 
And as teachers, how do we tell our students and when about all the difficult parts of our history, whether it's, you know, the history of the country or, or of our individual families. Mm -hmm. And that conversation is what shifted the whole project where I was like, this is bigger than just veterans, immigrant stories. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I hope uh, people will watch this and then head to the museum to take a closer look at the work that you have there because it's it's certainly um, these what these little Tamba talks leave me without words often so uh, and that's a good thing I think you know lots to, to think about there's a lot to think about and uh, it just surpasses visual art I think visual art is is just it doesn't even encapsulate uh, and a small amount of it. I mean, yes, we're, we're absorbing it all with our eyes, but at the end of the day, there's just so much cerebral energy that you're, that you're needing to uh, explore. Explore is not the right word, but it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. And so again, thanking you so very much for joining us and uh, good luck at the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me to have a talk.